Greetings, beloved. God is truly good. And now Family Community Church of Fresno presents Pastor Chester McGinsey. Pastor McGinsey is an anointed voice to the nations with a clear message, building God's kingdom and empowering God's people. Today's teaching will build you, strengthen you, and unlock some kingdom principles that will give you access to the life God originally designed you to live. You'll be challenged to possess the promises of God for your life. And now, please join Pastor McGinsey for this powerful and dynamic message. Turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11. Ecclesiastes, chapter 11. Allow me just to read one verse in your hearing this morning, and that would be verse 5. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. So you do not know the works of God who makes everything. Or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. So how do you know the works of God who makes everything? From Dream to Destiny, Part 3. You may be seated. Throughout the Old Testament, the development of a child in the womb is described as God's creative act of making a new person. The means by which God's single cell becomes a baby is one of the great unresolved mysteries of biology. Although we know that there is a natural process at work which scientists may one day understand and explain, we also know from scripture that divine power is at work making not a mere biological entity, but an, an eternal being capable of fellowship with the eternal. First of all, the dream of life and fetal development are God's work. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones may grow in the womb, one psalm says, the writer says, your hands made me and formed me. Another psalm says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. The prophet Isaiah speaks of the Lord who formed me from the womb. And Psalm 71 says, Psalms, you brought me forth from my mother's womb. Job speaks of God as he who made me in the womb. Where the Bible speaks of fetal development, it usually talks about God making a new person. We can conclude that the formation of a child in the womb is a is sacred work of God. He personally fashioned each of us in the womb just as surely as he fashioned Adam and Eve in the beginning. An abortion advocate on a radio talk show uh, was asked, does God make mistakes? The pro-abortionist quickly responded, well, I don't know about God because that is a matter of your own religion. But I do know that people make mistakes and when people make mistakes, they need a way to fix their mistakes. That answer reveals the major difference between the pro-life and the pro-abortion views. The pro-abortionists in their humanistic view cannot see the working of the invisible God behind the visible biology of human reproduction. They believe that man only comes from infallible man, and therefore human life can be a mistake. However, Christians believe that regardless of the human actions, 
and the circumstances surrounding the conception of a child, every baby comes from uh, the perfect, I said the perfect and holy God, amen, in his fashion, in his image, and his likeness. Amen. That's just a good place to clap right there. Amen. amen. I ask for it. Therefore, human life is sacred. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. It is striking to realize that mankind desires to be his own source of life. This is nothing new. Several thousand years ago, the psalmist noticed this same tendency, this same mode of prideful rebellion against God. Mankind wants to imagine that he can take credit for his own existence. But man's exaltation of humanity paradoxically leads to a diminished regard of the value of human life. Refusing to acknowledge God, he tries to fix his mistakes with solutions like abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, which all destroy innocent human life. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. Abortion is advertised as a solution to poverty, overpopulation, teenage pregnancies, mistakes made during adulterous affairs, but it is a death solution. Its predators administer death not only to the unborn child, but also to the second victim, the woman who is persuaded to abort. One Christian writer said it this way, and I quote, that the woman who procures an abortion aborts at the same time their human feelings. Millions of women have proven the truth of that statement as they have suffered painful, life-disturbing, altering effects known as post-abortion syndrome. Hundreds and thousands of women have suffered tragic long-term traumas from abortion experiences. However, later they have found healing in Christ who forgives, offers mercy, and abundant grace. Some of those women have written down their stories of entry into the congressional record of pro-life legislators, close quote. The scripture simply teaches, your hands made me and formed me. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. The Lord who formed me from the womb you brought me forth from my mother's womb. The second point is this. The dream of life begins at conception. So you do not know the works of God who makes everything? When does human life begin? The Bible has only one answer. As we just examined the passage of the prenatal life, we can see the postnatal life in regards to no less reverence, since he has only one answer. Over 20 years ago, when medical science started using microscopes in the observation of the fertilization event, it has been obvious that human life began at conception and nowhere else. I got my information off the Amen Google Medical Doctorate, Amen Degree Program, Amen, <laughs> Amen. So I just want to share that with you. <laughs> New technology such as ultrasound imaging of the unborn have only lent more strength to the fact of the unborn children are living members of our human society. The any search for a hypothetical dividing line marking the difference of personhood, amen, and in, 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 in some later point in the conception is fruitless and at best faulty. One Jewish doctor put it this way, he couldn't find the dividing line, amen, amen, amen. And he said, and so he made a comparison of searching for personhood in the traditional sense of what happens to a Jewish boy at the age of 13. And he discovered that there's no bar mitzvah in the womb. There's no point at which we cease being pregnant, pregnancy tissue, and suddenly become a human being. Starting at conception, each of us gradually pass through various stages that make up the human life cycle. Each of us, I mean the newly conceived, the fetus, the newborn, the toddler, the adolescent, the adult, the elderly, we are all 
at some stage in that gradual process called life. But it starts at conception and it never stops being life until you die or someone takes life out of you. The concept that all human life bears God's image is one of the exceptional foundations of Western civilization. Christianity introduced this biblical concept to the Roman Empire, amen, at a set time when men were considered to be gods and others were guarded as little less than animals. This notion of divine image in man gives us two moral pillars of our society which are stated in the opening lines of our Declaration of Independence, equality of human life. Every person is equal before God and therefore should be respected as equal by the law and by other institutions of human society. All men are created equal. Amen. And then there's, amen, sanctity of human life. All innocent human life is sacred. And therefore, every person has fundamental individual rights to live which cannot be infringed without the process of law, that they are endowed by their creator, amen, with uncertain, un unalienable rights, that among the, these are life, and I say life, and I say life, amen, today our society has forgotten about God when we talk about life. Many in our nations are advancing the concept of individual rights without recognizing the holy God who gave us our birthright. They fail to realize that freedoms which come from God cannot be ultimately survived in a society that denies the God of moral standards. Today, our Supreme Court has granted us so-called constitutional rights to abort at any time we wish. As the Bible believing Christians, we can make the following statement with absolute certainty. We have not been endowed by our creators with the right to shed the blood of innocent unborn children. On the contrary, in our society, amen, continues in allowing this practice continue unabatedly. Listen, the wrath of God will surely be unleashed upon us and our nation will be swept away by the events beyond our control. Is it just possible of all the madness and the ugliness that we are seeing in our nation? Is it possible because of all the shame of the innocent blood of God's creation. I want us to pause just for a moment, just for a moment, and think about what we just witnessed in the earlier part of the series. If a different decision was made not to have and to terminate, which one would not be here this morning? I'm so thankful for every life that God has given and parents have allowed to be. I'm so thankful for that. I know it's so easy to say you're taking a political stand. It's not a political stand. You can make it a political stand. It's a Bible stand. Amen. Amen. There comes a time in our own lives where we may have made decisions that are not the best. As I said earlier, God forgives. God dispenses his grace and his mercy to those that may have done wrong. But moving forward, amen, that's not our standard. Our standard is to do right by God and God's holy word. And so this morning, I just want us to just pause long enough. And I like to call the children up to the altar for prayer. I would like to call the babies up if they're here, and if the children, even, if, even from sixth grade down and younger, all the way to birth, if you'll just come to the altar. If your children won't come by themselves, parents, you can bring them with you. Let's stand here at the altar. I'm going to ask the ministers to come and stand around them. I'm going to ask the deacons that are here, if you're able to make it down quickly, come down and let's surround our children. What a great treasure we have right in front of us. Probably our greatest treasure on earth are our children. Therefore, our greatest responsibility to protect them and, and raise them up. So let me pray. Let's pray God's protection, God's blessing on them. 
Father, thank you for these children that stand right in front of us here. Young men, young women, boys and girls, infants. Lord, thank you so much for giving us this treasure. Lord, do protect them. The enemy stands around the bush and calls them to the side to destroy them, but you call them to yourself. Lord, give us wisdom as parents and uh, other adults to, to protect them, to pray for them, to teach them. Lord, we just ask you to raise up these kids to be servants of yours. Men and women, let them enter marriage, let them have their own children, let them enter society, and let them become great servants of yours. Lord, bless these that are in front of us. Be glorified by them. Lord, forgive our sin where we have failed to protect them or even bring them to birth. Lord, endow parents here with that kind of special care that you give them in their heart to raise these up, protect them, love them, and teach them. Lord, we commit these kids to you. Lord, make something great out of these kids. Protect them from the world and make them uh, mighty servants of God. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Later in that same chapter of Ecclesiastes in verse 9, it says, Rejoice, you young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart, and in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh. For your childhood and your youth are vanity. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you shall say, I have no pleasure in them. The challenge given by the writer of Ecclesiastics to the youth of this generation is a challenge that needs to be sounded to every generation. If you are fortunate to be young, you are the envy of all the aged. Youth is a priceless possession. It is sought after those who have lost it, believe me. <laughs> the world is in search of the legendary fountain of youth. As a young person, you, amen, you enjoy the blessings which the world is searching. Youth is the spring of life. It is the time of sowing. It's a time of planning. Youth is the time of developing habits that can give great promise to your future as well as for your destiny. Amen. There are many reasons why you should trust Jesus as your Savior. Yes. While you're young and determined to serve him as Lord throughout all of your life, the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes is Solomon, who was one of the wisest and, dare I say, the wealthiest men who ever lived. And he encourages us to remember our creator in the days of our youth. Amen. You may be asking, why is now the time you should trust the Lord for your dreams? And I'll tell you, first of all, number one, it's much easier to trust and follow Christ early in life. This is because habits of sin have not yet enslaved you, amen, and the patterns of evil conduct have not yet been fully developed in you. Many people expect to become a Christian someday. The tragedy is that many delay the decision to let Jesus become the Savior in their life until it's too late. Because no man knows the day or the hour when your last day may be. Amen. The wisest decision you can make today would be to trust Jesus as Christ, as Savior of your life. Amen. And then you have him as a friend throughout the remainder of your life. And he will guide and teach and help you all the way along the road of life. Amen. Secondly, why is now the time to trust the Lord for your dreams and your destiny? You have a whole life to give to God. Yeah. It is tragic to waste a life and to live, amen, live, live, and live it as the gift of God. Amen. It's tragic to waste that life. 
For life is truly a gift from God. Because life is so precious. It should be used wisely. Listen, once time is gone, you can't recall it. It's done. I can never be 40 again. I can try to act 20 every once in a while. Amen. But I got to, amen, go to bed with Ben Gay revved all over my body. It's gone. Dedicate yourself to Christ now. By doing, you will have a time to prepare for a life of service both to God as well as to others. Yes. Your greatest study opportunity immediately before you, God has blessed you with gifts and talents. Amen. If you will develop what he has given you and study hard, you will have much more to place at the disposal of God when you reach maturity. Amen. In the morning of life, Give the whole day to the Lord. Give your whole life to him completely. Solomon says in verse 9, rejoice. What joy is it to anticipate each day and expect it as a fresh gift from God? Every morning you wake up and you can jump out of bed. Amen. With joy in your heart. Solomon instructs young people to take advantage of the days of their youth before the days of darkness would arrive. He was suggesting that, he was not suggesting that young people, amen, that you'll have no problems, like older people have no joy, no. He was simply making the generalization that youth is a time for enjoyment amen. before the problems of old age settle in. I heard a couple of amens, all right, a couple of honest folks in the house. Walk in the ways of your heart is not an encouragement to go out for youthful flings and sow your wild oats and come to church on Sunday morning and somebody say, and pray for a crop failure. No. <laughs> it's rather a reminder of young people to enjoy the special pre uh, uh, pleasures that belongs to youth and can never experience it again in quite the same way. Those of us are older need to remember that God expects young people to act like young people. Solomon's warning is evident that he doesn't have sinful pleasure in mind. He says God will bring judgment. God does give us all things richly to enjoy. But it is always wrong to enjoy the pleasure of sin. Young people who enjoy life in the will of God will have nothing to worry about when the Lord returns. Amen. And then thirdly, why is now the time to trust the Lord for your dreams and your destiny? Christ can help keep sin out of your life. Amen. In verse 10 he says, therefore remove sorrow from your heart and away from your flesh. In verse 9 he says rejoice. In verse 10 he says remove privilege Privileges you enjoy must be balanced by what the pastor was saying, by personal what? Responsibility. Amen. Young people must put anxiety out of their hearts and evil away from their flesh. The word translates sorrow means vexation, inner pain, anxiety. He says, what? Get rid of that stuff. Remove it from your life. Amen. If you are living in the will of God, you will have the peace of God in your heart. The sins of the flesh only destroy the body and can bring eternal judgment to the soul. Mm -hmm. What many people do in the first years of their lives make their last years miserable. Make good decisions. Make good choices now. Think about it. Many of you are blessed to have godly parents in the home Amen. that know right from wrong and are doing their best to try to teach that and inculcate biblical doctrine into your life. Embrace it. Don't push back from it. Embrace it. Sometimes in our adolescent years, amen, there's a spirit of rebellion that comes that our parents can't tell us. That. Yes, they can. Amen. Amen. Yes, they can. Amen. The things that you choose to do now will make an impact on your life and will affect the balance of the rest of your life. How many people that have grown older, they can, can look back and say, you know what? I know when I made that mistake that changed my life. It was a bad choice. It was a bad decision. And it changed my life forever. Amen. 
Yes, does God forgive? Absolutely. The man that was staggering down the road and he was shaking and somebody would say, what's wrong with that man? He said, oh, he used to be an alcoholic. Well, I thought he was a Christian. I thought he could go to church. Oh, he does. God forgave him of his sin. But he's living with the consequences of his sin. Decisions at a young age to go partying and doing all this, this, this wild stuff caught up with him and it stuck with him. It's exceedingly important that you have Jesus Christ as your Savior in order that he might not only forgive your sins, but he will assist you in avoiding that which could destroy you. Amen. Amen. Sometimes you need that little voice to remind you when you're about to do something or go somewhere you're not going. You need that voice of Christ speaking, saying, no, it's wrong. Amen. It's wrong. Amen. It's wrong. And the closer you get, he gets louder. It's wrong. It's wrong. But yet you head right into it. You need the voice of Christ in your life to help you along the way. He who has fallen into great sin has nothing to boast about. Sin, by its very nature, is destructive. No good comes from sin. It corrupts, it defiles, it ruins, it tears up homes, it tears up relationships, it tears up marriages, it tears up careers, it tears up lives. Amen. Amen. I generally don't recommend movies, and I never have. I think I've only done it once in the 24 years for people to watch, but I remember once before speaking to the youth, I encourage parents, if you have teenagers that are starting to go out and do things and a lot of things they do and they're going off to college, I would encourage you to sit down and like I said, if they're of that age, and I, I don't recall hearing anything bad in the movie, but it may be some scenes that are pretty graphic, very explicit in a lot of ways. And that's the first version of the movie, Taken. Because a lot of times, as adolescents, we think we've got it all figured out. We know what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. And it's okay for me to go out and go to parties and do all these other things. And it's okay because I know myself. I know what I'm not going to do. I'm saved. Mama, don't worry about I'm saved. Yeah, baby, it's not about what you're not going to do. It's what those that are there may want to do to you that you don't have control over. And you may end up taking and not even realizing, oh, mama, you're just old folk, you know? I watched that movie five times or better. <laughs> I think I could have watched it in six, but <laughs> I know as a father's heart, that's what I would try to do for my child, obviously. Yeah. But I would never want my grandbabies to ever be in that situation. Sin has a way that it separates a person from their better self. Sin grieves the heart of God. Amen. It perverts us and prevents us from achieving the highest and the best that God has for us in life. Amen. Jesus Christ would guide you to avoid that which will destroy you. Yes. On one occasion, the psalm writer declared in Psalm 56, 13, for you have been delivered, for you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? He's kept my feet right. The Savior wants to prevent you from getting into something of which you would be ashamed of later, and that may even destroy your own reputation. In fact, he wants to lead you in the path that leads to right destination, both in this life and the life to come. And then fourthly, why is now the time to trust the Lord for your dreams and destiny? To avoid the possibility of becoming hardened to the gospel. Mm. In the scripture we learn today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart in Hebrews 3, 7 through 8. To hear the gospel, the call of Christ. And not heed it. It, 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 it is to do something to your spiritual eardrums that will make it more difficult for you to hear the call the next time. It's a dangerous thing to hear the call of God and not respond. Amen. While your heart is tender and your life, amen, is young, you should be exceedingly wise and respond to the good news of God's love amen. and that he loves you. It's, it's dangerous to walk away from God into darkness. 
Every time you hear the call of Jesus Christ and you turn a deaf ear, you are actually turning away from God and walking back into spiritual darkness. Yes, I hear you, preacher. God bless you. Give me a minute. I'll think about it. And maybe next Sunday. Amen. You don't realize what you're walking away from is you're walking into something, and that's Amen. darkness. Amen. There is always dangerous because what? The further you walk into darkness, and the deeper you walk away from God, the greater the danger becomes in your own life. Amen. Each time it gets a little bit easier to walk away from God. And then finally, why is now the time to trust the Lord for your dreams and your destiny? You have no guarantee of tomorrow. Amen. None. You're young. You're vibrant. You, you, you're full of zest. All that energy in your body. You believe you're going to live forever. Some of you are in the gym. You're, you're doing the cardio. You're doing your, your, your strength training. And you're feeling strong. you got the right diet. Do you not know that people go to bed and die healthy? Amen. Healthy. They just Amen. die. Amen. Remember now the creator in the days of your youth. Before the difficult days come and the years draw near. Because they're coming. As I said earlier, there's no doubt in my mind which way my body is going. Every once in a while, the wife got to tell me, straighten up when I walk. Hey, Amen. I'm bending over. Well, why you walk over like that? I'm going somewhere. Where are you going? I'm going to the ground. Earth, earth, that's what that. It, it, it knows where to go. It's almost like it's a magnetic pull. Straighten up. Got me one of them Tommy John t-shirts that stretch your back, pull your shoulders back. Rejoice, <laughs> remove, and now in 12.1, he says what? Remember. Yeah. The third instruction means more than think about. It means pay attention to. Consider with the intention of obeying. It is Solomon's version of Matthew 6.33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and his righteousness, and all these other things that you want in life shall be added unto you. If you seek first the kingdom of God, how easy it is to neglect the Lord when you're caught up in the enjoyment and the opportunities of youth. You know that dark days and difficult evil days are coming, so you better lay a good spiritual foundation early in life as possible. During your youthful years, the sky is bright, but the time will come when there will be darkness and one storm after another storm after another storm Amen. will come into your life. Mm -hmm. Amen. I was teasing Brother Marshall Kelly about his daddy this morning. His daddy would say, boy, you just keep on living. You don't know why things are the way they are. You just keep on living. The average life expectancy is now maybe in their 80s, but many people live well into their 90s and some even greater than that. But many of us will not live to that age at all. In a day of deadly diseases and, amen, disasters on the highways and in the air, air, air space, hardly a year goes by that some friend or some loved one, amen, is not ushered into eternity. This is a great reason why we should determine to trust Jesus Christ, amen, now as our Lord and Savior, while the blood is still running warm in our veins. In the Bible, everyone is encouraged to respond to the love, the mercy, and the grace of Almighty God. Nowhere in all of God's word are you encouraged to wait until you're 12 or 13 or 15 to make up your mind. You won't find that in the word of God. That's man's interpretation of something. You won't find it. Amen. When you have an ear to hear God's call in your life, you answer that call regardless of the age. Yesterday has flown into the tomb of time. Tomorrow it's just a dream. That's it, that's it. And it lies in the tomb of destiny. All we have is today. Today is the time when you should respond by faith to Jesus Christ. Trust him as your Lord and your Savior now. Amen. I would just ask that uh, you and the congregation, as a show of support, you would extend your right hand out towards this next generation. 
Would you bow with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, um, I'm humbled and honored to be asked to come before and intercede on behalf of this generation. You are preparing to carry on your legacy, a legacy of spreading the good news of salvation, of building your kingdom, of making a difference in the world. For this generation, these are stressful, insecure, violent times with many competing, confusing voices blaring in their ears. Social media with likes influencing personal value and worth, presenting a flawed image. Internet and TV providing role models that are in direct conflict with your word. Friends who are struggling with the same questions and yet put on a game face. Coaches, teachers who can have huge influence. A culture that worships stars of all kinds. Sports, media, music. Father, give them heroes worthy of their attention. Yes, Lord God. But who do they listen to? You have left a written record, Father, your Bible. And in it you said things like, you made them on purpose. Each is your own personal grand design. In fact, you declared each of them masterpieces. You showed them how much you love them and how valuable they are by sending Jesus. You told them to listen to the older generation, but then you told us, the older generation, how to live lives that are a model for these young yes, people. But we confess we haven't done that good a job. But you are faithful to your promises even when we falter. You personally instructed Joshua with these words. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So our prayer this day, Father, as their family here, is for these young people to know that you are on their side. Yes. To know they are more than conquerors through Jesus who loves them perfectly. Yes. To know the power of being more than conquerors through the youthful defiance of humor. The power of the gift of a smile at the sometimes serious, frightening business of life around them. To smile, Father, and yes, be confident. You blessed the meek and you said they would inherit the earth. We are not asking you to bless doormats. Show them that being stepped on today by a mindless society is not a Christian privilege. Give them the courage, wisdom, and dignity to lovingly talk back to a friend who thinks they have all the answers to their problems. Figure out how which politicians are deaf until election time. The wisdom to recognize the businesses run blindly by policy instead of thoughtfully by principle. Teachers who would intimidate because of their beliefs. To a neighbor who would rather threaten than reconcile. Continue to teach them to think based on your rock-solid word, not the winds of world philosophy. Lift them to their feet. Whisper in their ears. Give them a vision that is too big for them to accomplish without you. Poke them. Prod them to tell the world who our God is, who we are, and where we came from. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining Pastor Chester McGinsey for this powerful teaching. Family Community Church of Fresno is empowering millions of people around the world through dynamic preaching and teaching, humanitarian aid, and many other ministry efforts. For additional information and resources from Family Community Church, please visit www.familycommunitychurch.com or call 559-323-5002. We look forward to serving you in the kingdom.